screen better and all that. So your spotlight. Oh, right very nice. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, one of the big questions that I always ask when I do this class and other classes that are uh, extremely important for the sake of knowing something that a lot of people don't know. And that is when I ask a crowd of people in various classes, where is the capital of art in the world today? They don't know that it's New York City. And one of the big reasons that Alfred Stieglitz and Georgia O'Keeffe are such integral characters uh, that uh, participated way before America became the art capital, but they, cr they created an atmosphere in which artists knew that if they came to the United States, they would be successful. And we're going to see today some of the things that led up to America becoming the art capital. The important thing is this, that a lot of people certainly are very much aware of the fact that the Renaissance for 300 years plus maybe um, was in the Roman world. And it was primarily centered in Florence and Rome where the great Renaissance men, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and so on and so forth, all of these people were participating in making monumental, unique art for its period. And of course, today, integral to how we make art. Uh, what happened after Catherine de Medici married into the French world is that the capital of art changed and went to Paris. And Paris then, beginning with the 1600s, in many ways, became the art capital of the world for some 300 years. In 1937, New York became the art capital, primarily because the Nazis were becoming very powerful in Germany, as they had uh, taken control of the government there in 1933. And they were becoming ever stronger expansionists who saw modern art and abstract art as those people that make the kind of communication with art, because that's what art is. It's a way of communicating with people. Uh, they saw them as enemies of the state. Well, one of the big reasons that abstract art is made in primarily democracies is because democracies have to permit artists and authors and filmmakers to make the kind of art that they want to make, and then the public decides if it is something that they want to consume. Essentially, what will happen because of these uh, abstract Dada and surrealist artists, all of them being located in Paris, uh, at the time that the European world was in such turmoil, and because they became enemies of the state, they came to the United States because of Peggy Guggenheim, who helped them pay for their way to the U.S. and to and help them establish themselves here. This is when America became this important capital, a title that we still hold today and want to desperately hold on to because it is in every way a feather in our cap. It says that America has cultural significance. And because we are a relatively old country, uh, excuse me, young country compared to the uh, old cultural history that we are all bathed in, which is essentially Greco-Roman and therefore European, then it became an important moment for American history. Therefore, those people that set the foundation for America to be able to stabilize itself as the art capital, one of those people was Alfred Stieglitz. Alfred Stieglitz's family immigrated from the uh, German world, uh, I believe Berlin in particular. And when they came to the United States and then his mother had about six, five or six children uh, in the US, Alfred Stieglitz was the firstborn son and the one that was given the most attention to. He was 
sort of the king of the hill in that family. His father became enormously wealthy. Alfred Stieglitz's father became enormously wealthy because he was, as is true, generally speaking, in, in the Jewish world, uh, that uh, Jewish people have always been involved in the fabrics trade since, since the um, Silk Road. The Jewish world has always been heavily invested in the manufacture of, of materials, fashion, clothing, etc., And his father was a um, middleman for wool fabrics that were made in the German and the European world. And he was so successful at it and had such a huge wholesale company of these fabrics that he got the commission to supply the Union Army with wool fabric to make uniforms for them during the Civil War. On top of that, in 1871, when the Chicago fire destroyed so many miles of downtown, Saras of, of downtown Chicago, that they all had to be uh, restocked with fabric, he was one of those people that made another fortune on the back of that tragedy. However, what happened with Alfred Stieglitz's father is he thought that American education was not worthwhile. Consequently, he and his family uh, picked up stakes and literally moved back to Berlin in the 1880s so that his son could get an education in chemical engineering a subject that he was interested in. But what happened sort of unexpectedly is that his son Alfred fell in love with, with photography because photography began in the realm of chemistry. This is the reason why we would go to our local apothecary, chemist or pharmacist to pick up our photographs for generations after because photography was made with some of the same chemicals that medicine was made with and the various experiments that chemists were doing. What happened with Stieglitz then is he fell so much in love with photography that he wanted to investigate every aspect of it. And what was popular in the photographic world at this time, uh, about, about 40 or 50 years after we started to get photographic uh, studios all over the world making memorable pictures for people is at this time in history, we are around the French Impressionist period, around the French Impressionist and post-Impressionist period. And one of the things that the Impressionists did was that they told stories that had uh, interesting moods in them. Our American Impressionist uh, artist Tarbell, Edward Tarbell, was very much making the kind of genre painting or paintings of everyday life that the French Impressionists themselves were making. So what photographers did is they attempted to make photographs of everyday life and give these pieces of science, because this was founded in the realm of the scientific chemistry world, they attempted to make art pictures and they were then forever after known as those people that press a button and Kodak does the rest. So photography really did not have any connection with art necessarily. This is made by the hand of an artist. This is made by the push of a button on a machine. Therefore, it was going to take Alfred Stieglitz four decades plus to help elevate the science of photography to the art form that all of us agree it is. Now, so what you can see that is happening here that is so integral to all this is that photography is inherently flat. It comes out of a printer flat. And when, it, and, and, and as a consequence of the fact that it is flat, 
you always have to find numerous textures and numerous way to make these paintings come alive. This is why we see so many different textures here and even the blinds that he's captured that are kind of spanning the wall to make it all the more interesting. Essentially, this is doing something that one can do or one has to do because we have a mental memory of all of these textures. This is the reason this candlestick means something to us. This is the reason that the way the skirt is even lit by the sunlight. All of this comes to life because light is essentially what photography is. You are capturing light in a little box that has a tiny peephole in it. When the French Impressionists started to make their work with this newfangled oil paint in a tube, it was thick. It was a thick medium. And this is the reason why they could make their work come alive in this way and make everything sparkle and shimmer in front of our eyes. So naturally, when someone like Stieglitz, who is trying to elevate this science to an art form, he's going to do everything in his power to tell a story that's compelling of these women working so hard at, uh, at the riverbed, I think at the, uh, around the river uh, Seine at some point, in which they are doing the laundry there. And we know all of these textures. We know how our shoes make the ground crunch when we walk across it, and even kind of the sensation of water moving. So you can see what the big challenge is in the photography world. You have to make every element of the painting come alive. Now, photography had a lot to overcome. And that is that we know good and well that photographs are made in the sepia tones at this time. We do not have color photographs yet. Consequently, these kind of beigey tones or the, the ones that are made with grayish or blackish tones are the only thing that photographers have to choose from. They are manipulating the paper that they're printing their images on with various substances to turn them those colors, but there are very few to choose from. So what happens is this, that there is a huge, huge challenge and something that is very much in favor of the artistic world. They can make their canvases as large as they want, and they can also make them using any colors that they want. Whereas the photography world, though it might tell just as compelling a story of these people doing backbreaking work, and we see that this is a story in the Dutch world where women are very nervously and very anxiously looking toward the waterways because a very serious thunderstorm has come up unexpectedly and their husbands and sons and dads are on the waterways. And they are very worried here, all clustered together, hoping that the waves that, are, that they see in the distance do not destroy their boats and kill their men. Well, one of the things that we see here that is really extraordinarily interesting about this is how all of these shapes that are captured by Stieglitz, and mind you, at this point, he's only in his 20s or so, maybe 25, 26 years old, and he's only just discovered photography and a love for it just a few years prior. So this kind of sophisticated composition shows you that he has an artistic eye, and it also shows you that he's able to take all of these various shapes and position his camera in such a way that we are enthralled with the story. The contrast of black to white, the contrast of the worried looks on the women's faces, of them looking away from us, we still know from their stance and the way that their arms are held at their waist, 
that there is concern there and solemnity. He was so excited about this print that when he went to his dark room, he made a mistake and kind of innocently scratched it in such a way that it almost created this illusion of a church here, something that had a tall steeple. And he never reprinted it because he thought it had this surreal element to it in which God was looking over this scene of potential disaster. So, of course, these are all of the positives, but the negatives, as we said, are that photography uh, at this time could only be printed on a very small scale. If, let's say, what we see here is that uh, the canvas is almost three feet by say three and a half feet. Uh, these people are not tiny. They're also not the same size that we are because typically when, uh, when artists make big history paintings, the people in the paintings are oftentimes as large as we are in real life. But the larger the person is in a canvas, the easier it is for us to relate to their plight, to relate to that story. The photograph at this time, the largest you could make it was only four inches by eight inches. Consequently, it's not something you can easily relate to because it is minute. And this was larger. And on top of this, we have those people such as Charles Baudelaire, who were very supportive of the French Impressionists, and he, in fact, was very good friends with them, was trying to denigrate photography so that it would not assume a position as an art form. When he said, if photography is allowed to stand in for art in some of its functions, it will soon supplant or corrupt it completely thanks to the natural support it will find in the stupidity of the multitude. It must return to its real task, which is to be the servant of the sciences and the arts, but the very humble servant, like printing and shorthand, which have neither created nor supplanted literature. This was a big bomb. Naturally, this is a lot to overcome. Charles Baudelaire is a consequential poet, essayist, and writer. Well, there were some people that were going to make it their business, though, to elevate the science of photography no, long, no matter how long it took. Stieglitz initially got involved with uh, the Camera Club of New York when his family came back from Germany. And they started to print a magazine called Camera Notes. He stayed with it about six years. And then he wanted to introduce in the magazine modern art as well, because he wanted to show the correlation between photography and the arts, all of them, architecture, sculpture, painting, etc., as something to be appreciated on the same level. At that point, the Camera Club of New York essentially made it too difficult for him to do that because they thought he was making a mistake. So he started printing his own magazine called Camera Work. It was a sensation. And one of the reasons it was a sensation is because of all of the uh, experiments that were taking place and all of the ways that he was publishing, editing, and putting forward the concept of the artistry of photography. Now, what happened to Stieglitz by the time that he was 28 or 29 years old is his parents thought that he should probably settle down and get married to an equally wealthy woman uh, so that the families could incorporate and become all the more powerful and wealthy. And so he did just as his family expected. He married this young woman who was an heiress to a beer company. You can see on their wedding day how happy both of them are. They were not, obviously. And what happens is, though she was kind of a prudish bourgeois kind of woman who thought that when they went on their honeymoon, they would be 
having dinners at the best restaurants in Paris and seeing the best museums in London. And this is exactly what Alfred Stieglitz was not interested in. On their honeymoon, he made uh, groups of photographs from all over the European continent where this, they stopped in, uh, in various ships and ports and locations. And even until today, those 1890s photographs are considered to be among his best. The other thing that happened with this couple, which is so terribly unfortunate, is though they were married for over two decades, uh, their daughter was diagnosed with schizophrenia when she was in her late teens. And this was another situation that brought about a lot of grief in that relationship. Stieglitz though was completely consumed with one thing only. He put himself oftentimes in danger, uh, climbing to the highest heights to get exactly the kind of photograph that he wanted to make and to make the world come alive with his images. What we can see is that he has, uh, he is studying the compositional techniques of artists so that he can make relevant photographs that are similarly composed in that they are balanced and that they make a lot of sense and that they are interesting. This is a work by Monet. This is the photograph by Stieglitz. And we can see how artists can take a lot of liberties with their stories right now, because we see the, that Monet is making us see that the plumes of what would be black smoke coming out of the locomotive are turned into the clouds of heaven because everyone in Paris is so excited that they now have railroads to travel on. In America, of course, we see that this is the way that a typical train looks in the in, in most, most times that it's going down the tracks. There is very dark um, locomotive smoke coming out that's, you know, dark plumes that are dangerous to breathe in and it makes quite a statement. To Stieglitz, when he was doing this kind of work, because he came from an engineering background and because New York was becoming this monu monumentally industrialized city, he became interested in everything that had to do with engineering. When he made this profound photograph of the Brooklyn Bridge, in which he shows us that the old world with these kind of medieval shapes is being consumed or even subsumed by all of these cable lines that are holding up one of the greatest engineering feats of its day. Child Hassam, who was an American impressionist, is capturing something very similar. But we see that he is not at all interested in the engineering aspects of this, but he's trying to set a mood and kind of the complexity of his work is in the human experience on a very cold day crossing the Brooklyn Bridge. Now, Georgia O'Keeffe was about 20 odd years younger than Stieglitz was. She was raised on a farm her father was an Irish immigrant and her mother came from uh, Hungarian royalty in some ways, kind of dukes or marquis. Uh, she, her mother had enough money, I suppose, to buy a 600 acre farm in Wisconsin. And when she was raised in kind of the, these kind of, um, you know, in the, the 1800s, late 1800s, and kind of these austere circumstances where uh, there was no electricity yet and everything had to be done by hand, this is going to become very handy for her for future years because she will know how to take care of herself even if she doesn't have uh, modern conveniences. Her mother, because she had aspirations for her daughters, there were seven children and four or five of them were girls, 
because um, her mother came from this, you know, auspicious background, she sent her daughters for uh, art lessons and a music lesson every Saturday in which they went by horse and buddy, buggy in town so that the girls could have kind of this elevated idea of what life can be outside the farm. This is one of the paintings that Georgia O'Keeffe makes when she's 11 or 12. And uh, when another student said to her, you look, looks like to me that you're very talented. What are you going to be when you grow up? And this innocent, charming girl at that age said, I am going to be an artist, not knowing that there has never been, even up until this time, a woman artist that was ever significantly recognized in the art world. Now, Georgia O'Keeffe was lucky in many ways because she was able to educate herself as she pleased when she saved up the money to do so. Now, her family eventually left the farm and her father went into another business venture that was terribly, terribly unsuccessful. So there wasn't always a lot of money to have just to spend on anything, but she was able to get teaching positions in various places in the US, whether it was Virginia or Texas or uh, various uh, kind of distant places. And she made connections there. Uh, one of the most important connections she made was at the Art Students League of New York, which was founded in 1875. And it has been forever a who's who of American artists. People like Jackson Pollock, people that names we would recognize everywhere. Many of them were educated at the Art Students League, which was a place that uh, charged minimally for classes and some of the best teachers and artists in America were there uh, on staff. One of those men was William Merritt Chase. William Merritt Chase in the 1890s, of course, is making the kind of art that's popular in Paris because Paris is the capital of art and everyone knows about the French Impressionists. So he's making genre paintings. He's making paintings of everyday life, though he was an expert in every way imaginable. He could paint landscape and portraits, and you can see this almost picture-perfect still life that he made. Georgia O'Keeffe was one of his students at, in, in, in uh, the early 1900s, and she was utterly and completely bored by the instruction because she knew that by 1907, a lot of things were happening in Paris, and it wasn't painting still life. Now, she did win an award for this beautiful still life that was required of her. And typically, there are lots of elements in still life. This one is relatively simple. But you can see she won first place at the Art Students League for this, in which she painted very, very tenderly this, this little rabbit, God bless them, that is going to be tonight's dinner in that copper pot. Now, it, it's quite amazing to me how we can often almost, uh, without knowing who the artist is, oftentimes we can tell, uh, if you study long enough this subject, who makes a painting that is a male and how does a feminine painting look? Because this kind of vertical line is a very, very strong line and the way that the rabbit is strung up, we can see that it, he's been um, subdued. He's crucified, essentially. This is what we see in the contrast. Um, the, the rabbit has been crucified by a hunter. Whereas when we see these kind of horizontal lines, they're always kind of more peaceful and more gentle. Now, what happened when... O'Keefe was studying at the Art Students League 1907-1908 is that all the students heard that Rodin had been invited to send some of his watercolors, which he had made of Isadora Duncan, who was also at that time living in Paris, 
uh, and her dancers, he was making these kind of very simple watercolors that Stieglitz was able to bring to his gallery. As I said, his gallery was called 291 because it was located at 291 Fifth Avenue, a prestigious address. And what happens at this juncture is that Georgia O'Keeffe goes with other students. She meets Stieglitz, who she is utterly dismayed by because she finds him to be too autocratic and rigid and uninterested in showing these students these prints because they didn't have money, uh, 10 or $20 to buy these prints. And consequently, he really had no time for them. But she was quite taken with the work of Rodin because of its simplicity. But the other thing that had a much more profound effect on her after going to that gallery was that there was a huge new interest in Oriental art. In the Western world, Oriental art came to be known as Art Nouveau or Post-Impressionist. However, it did make its way into Western art in this way. They were appropriating, whether it was Monet or Whistler or uh, William Merritt Chase, they were appropriating all of these delightful things that were coming from the East to the West. And one of the things that everyone essentially noticed that was in the Western artistic world was that Oriental art was made in two dimensions. It wasn't designed in such a way that we would see the world. The way that we make art in the Western world is with focal point perspective, with mathematical perspective that represents what we see with the human eye. This was invented during the Renaissance and it continued as long as artists were making this kind of work. The people closer to us are larger, the people further away are smaller. This was not the case with the Oriental world. It was done in a way in which it was typically two-dimensional. There was the illusion of perspective in the background but it was not focal point perspective and it was flat and the paint was applied in blocks. The other aspect of Japanism that became a new thing for the West was that it was okay just to paint something very simple, butterflies, a sprig of flowers, a simple bird, and the way that drama was added to the story is with the lines. The lines were what made it dramatic. And this is the reason why when Vincent van Gogh falls so deeply in love with all things Japanese, his work is essentially mimicking it with the heavily encrusted paint that the French Impressionists were using. This is why oftentimes we see so many of the works that were made by Vincent van Gogh that were copies of this aesthetic. Now, the man that was teaching this in the US to American students was Arthur Wesley Dow. Kind of the simplicity of his work was what very much interested Georgia O'Keeffe. Never mind that in later years, he's going to publish a very important book that has to do with art and design, and it will permeate every aspect of the arts and crafts, but he will initially become a devotee of woodblock prints. And this is the way he will paint, and this is the way that Georgia O'Keeffe will often, often paint kind of this two-dimensionality and the illusion of perspective in the background. This simplified style of just filling something, filling the space on a canvas in a beautiful way, this too she will do. Now, one of the most important things and one of the most important contributions that uh, Alfred Stieglitz made for America in general 
was that he didn't care if you were a woman or a man, as the art world had always be do been dominated by men. He didn't care what sex you were if you did good work. The other thing is that he had a very important conversation with Gertrude Casabier, who was a woman that you can see has manipulated her photograph with uh, various brushes or pencils. And she's even scratched the negative or the positive, the process of photography when she made this portrait of Alfred Stieglitz. They decided, and they weren't the only ones, they decided that the only way that they could convince the world that photography is an art form is if the artist's hand was invested in manipulating the end product, that it wasn't something that was simply made with the push of a button and then chemicals in a dark room. Now, Gertrude Casabier was an expert photographer. This is one of my favorite photographs of hers in which you can see that other than this being a wonderful human interest story, we can see so many details because she has captured this photograph at the exact moment that light is coming through in the way that it does, that it shows us that the man that she's with is holding a, a pool cue here. We can even see the folds in his pants. We can see all of the elements that are picked up by the light because photography is writing with light. That's what it means. She is writing with light. She's picking up the, the roundness here that you can see of the doorknob, which balances the roundness of these beautiful pool balls uh, that are probably made of ivory at this time. The, Kayla, I'm going to inter interrupt. I'm so sorry. Are you sharing your screen right now? Because I'm not seeing the image you're referring to. Oh, yes. It says that I'm sharing it. Uh, your shirt. Is there, uh, if there's anyone here who does see the image, can you raise your hand or something? Because I'm not seeing it. I, I can stop sure. share and start again. Okay, Atasa, you do see you do see her in the image she's sharing? Yes. Oh, I take it back that I don't know why it looks like oh several people. Okay, sorry to interrupt. I'm just for some reason I stopped seeing it. Go ahead. You can continue. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Oh no, no problem. No problem. Um. So what 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 we can see here that is that is just absolutely so charming. Again, we have mental memories. We have mental memories of all these textures. That photography is inherently flat because it is inherently flat we have to make the textures talk and look how beautifully she's doing this and not only the rug which we see this kind of persian and oriental rug and so on and so forth but because of kind of the gentleness of the lace and the the kind of the um the the quality of the finished fabric here we even see kind of the um, the balance of these wonderful shapes here that are balanced by this shape. Everything about this is utterly and completely exquisite. Even this barrette, even this barrette in her hair captures the light that is coming through this window. It's extraordinary. Well, this is how photography becomes an art because the composition is perfection and the story is compelling. Now, there were other photographers that were doing very similar things at this time and they called them pictorials. They called these photographs pictorials because they wanted you to begin to think about this as a picture and this as a picture. We often refer to a painting as a picture. Consequently, Stieglitz was pushing this idea of pictorial equivalence. You can tell a story here with the ring toss. You can tell a story here and both of them are equivalent.
because we can relate and respond to both of them. Now, Gallery 291 became an enormously important place for America because he was one of the first to show modern art in the United States. That is not to say that there weren't people that already uh, owned modern art in America, but it was always in their private home. And it was never in any museum. The MoMA is not going to be founded until 1929. And that's going to be the first time that the general public in America will be exposed if they wish to go there um, to modern art that they can see every day. But a little bit after this time in history, 1913, Stieglitz is going to do something even more important for America. He's going to lay the foundation for modern art here. Now, he has this gallery in which he's trying to sell the, uh, the world on the equivalence of photography. But at the same time, what's happening here is nobody's really buying it in the figurative and the literal sense. And uh, what he has to do is he has to couple with a photographer who is also an artist. And his name is Edward Steichen. Edward Steichen, here you can see he has made a portrait of himself that was a photograph that has been heavily manipulated by his brushes. This is another thing that he does here as well. When he goes to Paris off and on, and where he sees and is introduced to people like Rodin, Gertrude Stein, all of these eminent figures that are in the Parisian world that are connected to art. When he sees this painting made by James McNeil Whistler, this is what Steichen does with chemicals and the photographic process. And he just continues to experiment to the extent that about 1907, we start to get color photography that is this kind of quality. And this is the reason that the art world goes berserk and has to make the kind of art that you cannot yet make with a camera. This is when we start to see these kind of distortions and the work of Brock and Picasso when they are inventing the whole concept of cubism, because you cannot do this with a camera. Oh, but yes, you can. Triple exposures. Yes, you can. Whereas Alvin Coburn would have done and made a portrait of himself that's sort of a regular photographic portrait, now he is going toe to toe. He started out making pictorials, but other artists are moving way beyond that. When Stieglitz makes this very famous work of people in steerage and those above them that are looking down, he has been influenced by these shapes that are being related to other shapes. This is precisely what he's doing here with a human interest story. The Dada, the Surrealist, those artists that are taking shape in the European world in which, for example, Francis Picabia makes a portrait of Alfred Stieglitz as a camera. And this drawing of uh, uh, Picasso's wife, Olga Koklova, they have moved into a different realm and photography will do the same. But Alfred Stieglitz, because of Steichen, who was going to France uh, on a very regular basis to see what was going on there so that they could bring those ideas to America, Alfred Stieglitz, Georgia, uh, uh, Gertrude Stein, Pablo Picasso, they were a force of nature. And because they were, they were able to change bit by bit, by degrees, the world's response to cubism and why it had anything to contribute to the arts. Gertrude Stein made a cubist poem about her friend Rose while they were sitting in the Luxembourg gardens eating ice cream. They are the cubists 
<clears throat> excuse me, are doing the kind of work that is unique and completely different that no one has ever seen. And so she is making kind of a cubist story about her friend. Now, of course, the arts are all interconnected. They're always interconnected. So it was a very, very clever thing for Stieglitz to uh, be shown not only as an expert photographer, but as an expert artist. And this, I have to tell you, I was lucky enough to see at Crystal Bridges in Bentonville, Arkansas. We went specifically to see these pieces that were made by Stieglitz, excuse me, by Edward Steichen. And uh, they are close up, amazing, absolutely amazing and extraordinary. He's even adopted the use of gold from uh, Gustav Klimt. Beautiful, beautiful work. This happened a little bit prior to the show to end all shows, I kid you not, this foundational moment in American history, the 1913 Armory Show that took place in which they took an armory building, took out all the guns and bullets, et cetera, for the National Guard, and they created these gallery spaces to show off American artists and European artists. Now, American artists were not known yet, so they had to, in order to draw people to come to see this event, they had to uh, publish names of people that would have been known, like Renoir, Picasso, Cezanne, et cetera. Alfred Stieglitz was very good friends with this woman, Anita Pollitzer, who was also someone that had met Georgia O'Keeffe at the Columbia uh, School for Teachers and uh, the University of Col Columbia University, and she brought the two of them together. Now, what happens with Pollitzer, because she's a suffragette and because she is, like most suffragettes, very supportive of modern art, because modern art represented freedom. And modern art has always represented freedom. But now people are going to learn that this is the case in the United States. Those women that paid for the Armory show, 75% of the funding for that show came from women that collected it five cents at a time. More than half of the European works were already owned by American women. The show led in the you know next decade and a half or so to these foundational museums that will all prove to be modern art museums of great consequence. Maya Shapiro, who was one of the teachers at Columbia University at that time, said that women were integral and that they were generous. And this is the reason why the show was the success that it was. Now, mind you, Georgia O'Keeffe, she is at this time of Yennevelt. She is teaching in Amarillo, Texas, and not even in Amarillo, outside of Amarillo, Texas. And because she's there and she's reading about the modernist and she's heard about the great armory show, et cetera, she starts to make this kind of work. She doesn't know why she's doing it, it's just coming naturally to her. And all of the rubbish that she ever learned before had no meaning for her. She started making art that was abstracted. When she and Stieglitz got together for the first time, he started making photographs of her. Her work is behind her. She was so completely enthralled with the possibilities that abstract art presented to her because of all the work that she had done previous to this time, she burned it all because she thought it was all nonsense. It was all copying, but now she was going to have her own unique voice. She wrote beautiful letters to Stieglitz. He wrote beautiful letters to her. They were madly, madly, madly in love. 
He eventually paid for her to come to New York and become part of his life there. He put her up in an apartment. Uh, and of course, he was essentially leaving his wife and family to be with her. And all of those artists that were in his milieu were interested in the newest things. And the newest things were those studies of Cubism, of Surrealism, and of Dada. So because Cubism is in many ways a story about shapes as they relate to other shapes, Paul Strand became one of those photographers that Stieglitz supported at the gallery. There were about anywhere from seven to 10 artists that he was always supporting so that they could have enough money to get started. And then they would sell their work through his uh, gallery and receive commissions. Strand is making a photograph here of shadows, how they fall on this uh, concrete top or you know this kind of stone top. And then Georgia O'Keeffe is being influenced by his work. The Dada, the Dada and Surrealist movement made Stieglitz want to create something unique and he did this with a double exposure. He was absolutely delighted when this happened, and he was absolutely delighted when he met and got together with Georgia O'Keeffe because he said, we finally have a woman on paper. We finally have a female because those women were so integral to the success of the 1913 show, he wanted desperately to feature a woman. Well, what do artists do? They start taking pictures, in particular of pretty ladies. And as he continued, and this is quite shocking, the next one when you see this, he took hundreds of photos of Georgia O'Keeffe. And it was not as if no one had ever made photographs of nude women in the Greek tradition. Yes, they did. And there were many moments in which these kinds of, uh, the nude was always a big genre in the art world. But everyone knows that the nude is not even really supposed to be looking at you. She is a piece of erotica, if you will, but she's supposed to be appropriate. She doesn't even know you're looking at her. The teacher of Giorgione, Titian, he makes his version of this. It's a little bit more naughty, but she is still demure. So what does someone do when they see these photographs at Studio Gallery 291 of Georgia O'Keeffe nude in this way and her paintings are right beside it? She's referring to these as music because she's been influenced by Kandinsky who used to listen to music and said music had a strong correlation with painting. Well, from this moment forward, of course, every single thing that she's ever going to paint for decades is going to get Freudian interpretation and not the good kind. The insults that she got the approbation that was served to her on a plate and the reproachment that was reserved to her, you know, with dirty looks and everything else. The fact that this woman is not only posing nude and everybody sees this in public, which she begged Stieglitz not to do. But he was such a hard headed bulldog that you could never talk him down. She was uh, in a psychiatric unit for a while. She couldn't deal with the aftermath of that. When she finally started to paint again, she sort of went to very safe subjects. And what could hurt with a landscape or a sunrise or just apples because aren't apples just apples? And after all, who had anything to say about apples after Cezanne, so what's the point? She wasn't going to paint apples the rest of her life. Bit by bit, as she got better, she started painting again. 
she started most of her work with traditional kind of looking flowers and so on. And flowers were not antagonistic. So, okay, she's going to make flowers. But she always went for the abstract. She always let her hand go where it wanted to go. Eventually, 1924, Stieglitz and she get married. And uh, this is when she kind of, she doesn't want to get married. She never wanted to get married. But now since Emmeline, his first wife, had given him a divorce finally after six years and all this contentious, you know, um, situation when he wouldn't go home, etc. Okay, they get married. She doesn't want to, but she's going to have enough money to buy the largest pieces of canvas she can possibly find because she is going to tell stories about flowers. And one of the reasons she became so immensely interested in flowers is because of the Leica camera. When the Leica camera was invented, you could take close-ups of photographs and the images were absolutely crisp and detailed. And this is one of the reasons that she is going to make seven very, very red poppy paintings that will make her very well known. She is in fact going to sell this poppy painting, if I'm not wrong, this painting for in that day's money was something like $22,000 in today's money. It's something like 347,000. So she knew that by having married Stieglitz and the fact that he was always going to be pushing for her, she would become a woman that could sustain her own life and pay for her own life, irrespective of what happened. Stieglitz was interested in promoting American artists after he saw that the French artists were uh, selling works or, or artists that were from France, not of them, or not all of them were French necessarily. But this school of artists were among the ones, including Georgia O'Keeffe and others that are not pictured here, that he essentially supported until they could sell their work. So one of them was Arthur Duff, who was working in this kind of abstracted way, trying to catch wind as it goes through the bushes, through the trees. He's also kind of making these spiritual works that uh, remind us of um, nature's ability to change and morph and all the beautiful colors it creates. If we put Arthur Dove up against Georgia O'Keeffe, there's no comparison. Her work is so profoundly strong, so rhythmical and so stormy that there is something about her that just screams that her ability goes beyond almost anyone else at this time. She became America's first major abstract artist and she was a female. She was put up against people like Marsden Hartley, who was, she said, according to her, painting a parade coming out of a closet. She went up against Charles Demuth, who was considered an abstract precisionist painter who wrote after this poem by his friend, uh, whose name was Bill William Carlos Williams, who wrote about this train pulling away. He created, I guess you could say, one of the first pop art paintings ever made. But it was this abstracted idea of the fire engine number five pulling away from you as you're looking in that direction. Another man that was very much a favorite of Stieglitz was John Marin, who was always desperately trying to capture the verve and um, the life in New York City, but he could never do it. He could never do it in the way that Georgia O'Keeffe did. She and uh, Stieglitz lived in the um, 
a Shelton Hotel. So what she's sort of giving us, she's giving the Shelton Hotel some, some life here, if you will. And then there is an encroachment of another high rise that is there. But the sunspots on this hotel give it a different edge altogether. They were both often working from their um, their veranda or their porch off the hotel room. Stieglitz was making photographs and she was making paintings. In fact, most every critic agreed that she was the only one that could really capture the exuberance of the spirit of New York at this time with her high rise paintings. When she was madly, madly in love with Stieglitz, she could paint you a symphony of good emotions. When she was in love with nature on Lake George, she would make these kind of paintings lying back on some kind of a wooden bench. But eventually what happened just four years and maybe 10 years after they got together is Stieglitz started to have an affair with a young woman that was in his studio every day of the week. She later wrote a biography about him, which was a celebrated biography. These are some of the photographs that she was making under his tutelage. And this is when Georgia O'Keeffe started to go out West. She started to spend more and more and more time out West because she wanted to be away from the situation in New York. Though she and Stieglitz were writing compulsively to each other, it is at this time that she makes probably one of the most patriotic paintings in America. Something that is unequivocally a painting that belongs to America, a buffalo head, red, white, and blue. Though the uh, in just a few minutes, we will finish, but I want to cue you into the fact, of course, that I think some of you know very well that Paul Cezanne fell in love with this mountain that was right outside his studio space uh, in, uh, I think it was Aix-en-Provence, where he was living, but so it's known as Mont Saint-Victoire. And he painted it over and over and over again until toward the very end of his life, right? 1906 or so, he just was painting. He painted it more than 70 times, I think. Uh, he just painted the feelings that he had while he was looking at that glorious mountain. Well, she had her own mountain that she could see from her studio, the Pedernal. The Pedernal was her gift, essentially, to mankind. She said, God gave me this mountain and I will give it back to America. He even told her in a dream that if she painted it as, as many times as she possibly could, he would give it to her. What happens with the two of them became such a consequential event for the United States that she lived, I believe, more than 40 years than uh, after he passed away, he he passed away. We have to check the uh, the dates again of when they were both alive. But she certainly lived considerably longer than he did, and and she was about twenty three years younger. When she started to plan, how is it that she wanted to preserve her immortality? She called the man that had made these famous portraits in the nineteen hundreds, and his name was Yusef Karsh an Armenian. He was the man that everyone called if they wanted to be immortalized. And here she is, this simple, elegant, unpretentious, uncomplicated, talented American farm girl that lived about as close to nature as you possibly could. He and she are incredibly important for America. He worked for so many decades to elevate the status of photography to an art form. 
but he also created a place for women in the art world. He made her a world known name in her own lifetime, which was absolutely not heard of. Even at this time in history, people like Bert Morisot or Mary Cassatt, still at the beginning of the 1900s, did not have the prestige that they will eventually get and deserve. But the two of them together sent the found, created the foundation, the absolute foundation for America to become eventually the art capital of the world. It's something that I am extremely proud of, and I bet you are too.